Right, hello everybody, good afternoon. Happy International Women's Day to you all. My name is Alden Sapor Marty Wood, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English here at Rice University. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm also a faculty affiliate with the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, as well as the Chow Center for Asian Studies. It is on behalf of Rice University's Chow Center for Asian Studies that I'd like to welcome you to the second lecture of the 2022 Transnational Asia Speaker Series, which is made possible through the generosity of the Ting Sung, the Wei Fong Chow Foundation. Today's event would not have come to fruition without the enthusiastic support of the Chow Center's executive committee, including the center director, Lisa Balanablar, and the tireless work of Hei Jin Ko, Hei Hun Matos, and Amber Simzik. For those of you joining us via the Zoom webinar, hello. Uh, we're broadcasting from Herring Hall in Houston, Texas, on the traditional lands of the Atacapa Ishak people. We acknowledge this indigenous history of the location which many of us here now call home. We wish to uplift our contemporary, the contemporary voices of the six bands of the Atacapa Ishak Nation currently residing in southeastern Texas and Louisiana. This is one of the first in-person events for the Chow Center since the beginning of the pandemic. Yay. And we're very excited to share space again in this way. We ask folks in the physical audience today to remain masked throughout the duration of the lecture. Today's distinguished speaker, Nefertiti Exum Tadyar, is Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Barnard College, Columbia University. Professor Tadyar is author of Things Fall Away, Philippine Historical Experience and the Makings of Globalization, published in 2009, and Fantasy Production, Sexual Economies, and Other Philippine Consequences for the New World Order which was awarded the Philippine National Book Award in Cultural Criticism in 2005. She's also co-editor, along with Angela Davis, of 2005's Beyond the Frame, Women of Color and Visual Representation. Professor Tadiar joined the faculty of Barnard in 2006 after teaching in the Department of History of Consciousness at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and before that at the University of the Philippines, Dilema. To appropriately state the wide-reaching importance and impact of Professor Tadiar's work, one must use language like pathbreaking, trailblazing, and field-defining. She is, without a doubt, one of the most cited and distinguished feminist theorists working on the Global South today. For those of us working at the intersection of global political economy, Marxist feminist thought, materialist post-colonial theory, and Philippine and Philippine American study, Philippine X American studies. Professor Tadiar's illuminating scholarly insights and unwavering political commitments represent the pinnacle of a mode of praxis oriented. She remains bound to the societal stakes it fiercely wagers in its pages. Professor Tadiar's scholarship refuses the hopeless quiescence demanded by the ever shifting terrain of global capitalist accumulation. It refuses the causal continuation of imperial domination and neocolonial extraction with its uneven logics of feminized and racialized labors, and instead insists that we can and should imagine otherwise. Today's lecture, Serviceability and Expendability in the Globopolis, will introduce us to the broader scope of her most recent book, Remainder of Life, which will be published by Duke University Press later this year in July. This current project has been described as a meditation on the disposability and surplus of life making under contemporary conditions of the global empire of capital. And indeed, as someone who has been engaging with and learning from Professor Tadiar's vital work for a long time now, I'd like to humbly call our attention to the appropriately dialectical thematic between limits and possibility that consistently appears as a through line in Professor Tadiar's scholarship across the years. From her earlier work on the transnational sexual economy structuring the feminization of Filipino labor export, and the keen analytical eye brought to bear on the too often overlooked forms of diasporic reproductive labor, to this more recent work on the lifetimes of disposability, Professor Tadiar has always vigorously attended to the various embodied labors standing in the margins of capital's formal, formal production of value, from the obscured vantage points of both social reproduction and surplus population. Her writing defiantly centers the so-called periphery, not only in terms of transnational political economy, but more intimately at the level of those less visible gendered labors sustaining the work of domesticity, of reproduction, of care, which often fall away from the spectacleized circuits of capitalist valorization. This focus continues in her recent work on what she calls remaindered life, which she defined in an earlier essay from 2015 as, quote, an analytic category 
for thinking about life-sustaining forms and practices of personhood and sociality that, despite being pushed into permanent outmodedness and illegibility by the discursive and practical mandates of imperial reproduction, persist in creative, transformed ways as practices of living. Important soft technologies or means of social reproduction, particularly among disenfranchised social groups. In these words, we can hear the care brought by an incomparable scholar activist to thinking through the continued agency of the myriad lives rendered superfluous to global capital's unmitigated crises. Instead of marginalizing these lives by understanding their context merely through necropolitical abjection, or flattening their nuanced narratives into the ledger language of finance capital as, to rework Marx, the world's new post-industrial reserve army, Professor Tadiar's work on remaindered life promises to radically redefine how we conceive of excess, expenditure, and surplus in an era of capitalist underdevelopment that we might claim has moved beyond the well-worn axiom of accumulation by dispossession into something like accumulation by disposability. Utopian to the core, in the most radically affirming ways, Professor Tadiar's writing resists the closure of historical time into capital's dream nightmare of pure ahistoricity by demanding that we attend to those other lifetimes beyond valorization, thereby opening up the possibility for apprehending and experiencing the life-making practices of freedom already present in these so-called superfluous spaces. Professor Tadiar's own words from 2009's Things Fall Away beautifully capture how this perspective on life-making in those gaps defined by the ever-decreasing distance between surplus labor and surplus population offers, quote, an opening beyond the division between reproductive and productive activity, between disposable life and valuable life, between the human and the inhuman, and between life and death, on which all realist power and political possibility now depend. And I remain deeply indebted to the political possibilities opened up by Professor Tadiar's steadfast praxis scholarship. She's a brilliant cultural theorist whose work I hold in the highest regard, and I'm eternally grateful for the power of her words. Words that have profoundly changed how I think about, exist within, and attempt to nurture the shared life makings of other, more utopian words, worlds within the dying embers of this one. I'm so thrilled to be welcoming her to Rice as a distinguished lecturer, lecturer in our Transnational Asia Speakers Series. Please join me in extending a warm Rice welcome to Nefertiti Tatiya. Thank you, Alden, for that beautiful, um, powerful introduction. It's been a long two years, and so I hope I still have some of the uh, hope and optimism that uh, past works <laughs> have exhibited. But um, I wanted to thank um, Dr. Alden Sager um, Wood and Hei Hun Matos and Amber uh, Sismic uh, for their help in uh, making this um, possible today, as well as the Chow Center for Asian Studies. In the early 1990s, harrowing reports of the cru cruel physical violence inflicted by employers on overseas Filipino domestic workers brought the Philippine state and the nation into a moral, political, and economic crisis, precipitating a whole set of national legal reforms and international agreements that finally resulted in the reformation of the Philippine state into one of the most successful labor brokerage states in the world. Today, the Philippine state oversees <clears throat> the annual deployment of around 2.3 million workers as overseas or migrant labor in some 200 countries and territories, including sea-based commercial fleets around the globe. These workers join a total of between 12 to 15 percent of the Philippine population of now uh, 106 million now overseas, whose annual remittances in 2019, reaching $33.5 billion, was until 2018 the third largest in the world, following India and China. Since Philippine labor export began in the 1970s, the figure and reality of slavery, gleaned from the conditions of overseas domestic workers in particular, have shaped how the problems of overseas domestic workers have, has come to be dominantly understood and addressed. As in the civilizing project of US colonialism in the Philippines, slavery has been the object of negation of numerous protectionist humanist campaigns, which together have served to uphold the freedoms of global capitalism and have helped to install the provision of reproductive work 
as the cornerstone of the Philippines' role in the global economy. That is to say, protectionist humanist campaigns have led to the transformation of the Philippines, not just the state, but a whole array of institutions, including universities, as a global provider of means for the direct social production of other societies. While there is no gainsaying the importance of legal protection and labor rights won by activists and NGOs from the Philippine state, which passed a Magna Carta um, of the Migrant Workers Act um, in 1995, which offered legal assistance and protection uh, for individual rights and welfare, the reconfiguration of what were blatantly labor commodities of a warm body export national economy into worker subjects the process of humanizing them as valued migrant citizens has been part and parcel of the Philippines' political and economic transformation as a major global manufacturer, provider, and broker of reproductive workers worldwide. The consequences of this national transformation, affected through the refiguration of its warm body products for export into martyrs and heroes, hardworking, self-sacrificing, skilled workers, family-oriented, faithful citizens, the, the, that, that is, the exemplary, valuable, and value-making subjects, are multiple. The enormous cash remittances of overseas Filipino workers have not only kept the Philippine economy afloat, providing 10% of the GDP, thereby legitimating the labor brokering strategy and authority of the Philippine state, and subsidizing the very conditions of social reproduction of low-cost migrant labor. These remittances and workers' transnational needs for communication and transport, cash, goods, people, have also catalyzed the proliferation of business and development enterprises, which aim to take a sizable share of this new burgeoning market of consumers and entrepreneurs. Migrant workers are in fact investors in the booming real estate industry in all the urbanizing sites both in and beyond Metro Manila. Their affective investments in their homes solicited and translated into property gains. While they strive to support their present households, they are also investors in the collective futures of their families through the requisite education of their children, which enables the latter to become upgraded skilled labor slated for a new round of overseas migration. In this way, migrant workers are not only engaged in the social reproduction of their host societies at little or no cost to the host nation's social capital, through their financial material affective remittances, they are also tasked with social reproduction of otherwise expendable populations and the post-colonial states that serve as the condition of their production as marketable, serviceable life. Much of the scholarship on global reproductive labor and overseas migrant Philippine workers, uh, the majority of whom are, in employ are women employed in domestic and care work, but also a large percentage of whom are men employed as low-level seafarers in the global shipping industry, where Filipino contract workers comprise a quarter of the world's seafaring labor force. This, a lot of the work concords with this, this economic approach to global domestic care and service work as labor and to migrant workers as laboring subjects. I neither deny nor diminish the critical importance of viewing global reproductive work as labor. It is quite obviously the case that reproductive work has been capitalized globally. However, insofar as the global capitalization of domestic and care work in particular is of a piece with the capitalization of reproduction more generally, the category of labor tends to oversimplify the organization of important differences in the kinds of reproductive life activity subsumed by capital, and furthermore to obscure the social engines of survival of disposable life that serve as subaltern drivers of the global economy. In today's, these are little, in today's new global political economy of life. All life bears the potential to serve as a direct means and source for the extraction of capitalist value. Through the real subsumption of society by capital, it is argued, the time of labor has become indistinguishable from the time of life. Processes of value extraction are no longer confined to the sphere of industrial production and factory, but in fact extend to the sphere of circulation and reproduction, where goods and services are in exchange and consumed 
and forms of social cooperative and recreative life enjoyed and regenerated the social factory. However, far from inaugurating a general exploitation of all life as labor, as this notion of real subsumption of society by capital might suggest, an important racialized distinction obtains between life as labor and life as waste. In contrast to the accumulable productive lifetimes of enfranchised citizen subjects, such as post fordist cognitive and communicative workers who exemplify life as labor, the lifetimes of disenfranchised, dispossessed peoples who exemplify life as waste are constantly diminished and marked for expenditure. By expenditure, I mean to refer to the myriad ways that people who are jettisoned from the privileges and rights of life guaranteed global political citizenship international refugees, the internally displaced, dispossessed native peoples, the incarcerated, undocumented and detained, the homeless, the criminalized, and the immiserated. These people are nevertheless able and forced to, to yield value through the spending down of their actual and promised present and future lives, whether through private and public industries of security or financial speculative enterprises of states in which they serve as monetizable derivative assets and collateral for loans. It is out of these pools of so-called redundant populations of the global south that a global stratum of serviceable life is put to work in the social reproduction of a global political humanity. Defined by life worth living, that is life with its, the capacity to yield accumulable value, often transmissible across generations, Global political humanity is the central object medium of capitalist accumulation. As such, however, it depends not only on the devalued serviceable lifetimes of others for the social reproduction of its own capitalizable lifetimes, but also importantly, the lucrative production of absolutely expendable life. Indeed, what underlies the Philippines success as a major provider of global reproductive labor is a post-colonial history of international loans, national debt servicing, conditioned by World Bank economic development and restructuring programs, violent land dispossession at the hands of agribusiness, real estate development, resource extraction industries, and increasingly financialized counterinsurgent war continuing into the present. The global serviceability of Philippine human life and life capacities has been produced through the system, systemic process of devastation that has impoverished and devalued the majority of the national population, dispossessing them of survival at home and rendering them disposable for the needs of capital everywhere. More, such serviceable life has been secured and securitized by the violence of ceaseless domestic Cold War and post-Cold War counterinsurgent campaigns, including the current war on drugs and war on terrorism waged by the Duterte state forms of spectacular murderous violence that create the conditions of absolutely expendable, um, the, uh, the absolutely expendable expendability of the urban poor, rural, rural farmers, indigenous and Muslim communities, the pool or fund of dispossessed populations out of which serviceable life can be temporarily and cheaply redeemed and transacted. Serviceable life is completely intertwined with absolutely expendable life in more than one way. Filipino workers replaced expulsed Palestinian labor after the Second Intifada and now compose the largest ethnic group of caregivers in Israel. In 2018, two years into the war on drugs that uh, has now killed over 27,000 people, Duterte signed memorandum of agreements with Netanyahu reducing brokerage fees for the 28,000 Filipino caregivers in Israel in exchange for mutual investments. Um, part of a set of agreements that includes the Israeli Defense Force um, training the armed forces of the Philippines in counterterrorism techniques and the Philippines' direct purchase of missiles, drones, um, and radars from Israel. In the global U.S. war on terror, the Philippines functioned as logistical and maintenance support for the global U.S. invasion um, and the occupation of Iraq, supplying the largest number of foreign contract workers to service U.S. military coalition camps and to work for private military contractors charged with post-war reconstruction. 
Together with other, they call them TCNs, third country nationals, ma maintaining US detention facilities and military bases in different regions, including Guantanamo Bay. Filipino contract workers play important laboring and non-laboring auxiliary parts, supporting contemporary US security architecture and logistics at home and abroad, contributing to the general expansion of expendable life. In light of this vital mortal business, I want to suggest another way of understanding the role of Philippines as well as other Asian diasporic servitude in contemporary global capitalism, beyond its construction as invisible or unaccounted, unremunerated labor, and beyond, therefore, its redemptive potential as a free political citizen subject, as the very exemplar of valued life. To view the function of global servitude as an instrument or means of production of valued life, the life of capital, rather than as laboring subjects, is to understand its intimate entwinement with the absolute expendability of wasted life. It is this ambivalent placement between value and waste that makes serviceable life at once essential and dispensable, positioned between the life of value they are charged with reproducing and the life of waste that is their own condition of social reproduction. Migrant workers are essential workers as they have come to be recognized as nurses, caregivers, food servers, delivery workers, drivers, etc., upholding the lives of citizens. And yet, they are also dispensable, like single-use goods, infinitely replaceable, because issuing from a seemingly bottomless pool of undifferentiated masses of workers, the violence of their making and maintenance as affordable, pliable, serviceable life made inadmissible or altogether invisible. Violence forever shored off in alien places where global servants are sourced. To view the racialized and gendered function of servitude as capitalist means of production or infrastructure, rather than as laboring subject, is to acknowledge its historical and structural lineages in colonial indenture and slavery, and its active constitution through disavowed wars of imperial dispossession. It is also to understand the particular role and form of agency that servitude plays within the new political economy of discrepant lifetimes, partic particularly within the context of what I call uber-urbanization, the global process of construction and expansion of metropolitan platforms for the value productive movements of connectivity rather than settlement of global political life modes of value extraction through the servicing of circulation itself. Such modes of value extraction depend on these disposable lifetimes of a worldwide service stratum whose work is to save as well as produce the valuable lifetime of their clients, employers, that is to serve not only as the means of reproducing the lives of the latter, but also as the means of facilitating the necessary movements of capital. In, in, in global logistics. Migrant reproductive workers are, are part of this global stratum of formal and informal service workers, itinerant, migrant, and urban excess populations who act as time-saving and time-producing machines, facilitators of the value productive activities and movement of an ascendant global class as well as other forms of global capital. They serve as vital infrastructure for the social reproduction of lives of value, wielded as human capital, as well as the means of reproduction of global capital as a whole. Philippine domestic workers, nurses and caregivers, sex workers, seafarers, call agents, military-based maintenance workers, troll armies for hire, social media operators, servants and drivers and couriers are all instruments for the facilitation of the value productive global circulation and mobility of capital whether in the form of people, information, goods, or money. These life capacities are placed at the disposal of the sheer circulation of human commodity investment capital that is at the core of a financialized global economy increasingly driven by capitalist platforms. In the temporary, repeated, on-demand lending of their bodies, capacities, social relations, and coordinated practice, and know-how to the ever-changing and moving needs and demands of employers and patrons, migrant domestic workers function as all-around household appliances and domestic implements, 
helpers whose design or designated purpose is to save their employers valuable lifetimes. As machines for other humans' valuable life production, they are producers of the valorizable lifetimes of others. Like convenience foods and food services, servitude provides, besides, besides immeasurable social and subjective values of well-being, comfort, self-esteem, care for children, etc., meeting the most intimate needs of others. It provides savings in that non-material use value of time. Instead of being wasted on the chores of life maintenance, the surplus time can save, can be absorbed into the higher value and valorizable lifetime of employers. What is one's, li one's life to spend depends on the expenditure of the lifetimes of others. In the global maritime industry, crucial to those global supply chains that I saw, which undertakes you know, um, most of the global trade, 90% of global trade is through shipping. Roderick Gallum argues, servitude is a technology that shipping labor recruiters or manning agencies use to exact unpaid labor from thousands of young Filipino men aspiring to employment as seafarers. Called utility men, these young men work essentially as free helpers for manning agencies, doing clerical and janitorial work as well as errand and courier work for the agency while also performing domestic cleaning and laundry duties and childcare for agency owners' families and serving as personal drivers and additional labor in the owner's other businesses. They may do this free work for up to two years in exchange for a future job. The expectation that utility men work for free and incur whatever financial costs or debts necessary in order for them to do this work is based on the notion that such service rendered and its future promise saves them from wasting away in unemployment. Even as servitude is held out as redemption from a lifetime of waste, it is itself a means of wasting the lifetimes of those it saves. Utility manning, for example, entails only the arbitrary prolongation of men's time of servitude, extending the time of waiting for the job or its sudden termination without reward, that is, without adding up to actual employment, such examples of wasting their time are inflicted as forms of punishment for whatever their superiors consider, but consider punishable offenses, a punitive measure with a pedagogical disciplining bent. As Gollum insightfully argues, along with practices of making utility men stand at attention, control their emotions, keep quiet, and swallow their pride. Practices of wasting their service time by extending it or by discounting it altogether, uh, its cumulative value at will, are principally a means of preparing utility men for subservience, um, a manufacturing docility, and more generally instilling the proper dispositions of a seafarer at the lowest rung of the industry. More than this disciplining function, the careless expenditure of people's lifetimes is a means of their further devaluation. It is not because people are of lesser value that their time is wasted, but rather that the wasting of people's time is a way of decreasing the value of their lifetimes. To waste people's time is to make that time itself mere waste. To make the, those people the bearers of such waste, worth nothing, is to make them akin to waste themselves, worth next to nothing. While undoubtedly local social hierarchies have naturalized forms of domestic servitude within many post-colonial communities, today servitude acts as a generalized social protocol in contemporary modes of value extraction, exemplified in software as a service business models such as Uber, which convert people's times of waiting or idle lifetimes into the work of waiting on others. And on-demand mobile services, um, like that TaskRabbit, which through the disaggregation and distribution of traditional jobs, convert what would be understood as the waste, that is unemployed people's lifetimes, or the unemployed free time of the partially employed, into productive on-demand 
or on-call work detail. Aiming for frictionless efficiency through the elimination of the inevitable slack in older personal bonded as well as industrial um, Fordist models of service labor, leading mobile app-based services, uh, service enterprises seek to effectuate a perfect meshing of two orders of media, technological achievement. They seek to fuse and incorporate the disaggregated, individuated human parts of the enterprise as component media within a total integrated platform to program the function of humans as media for other humans. As a form of organized servitude, vital infrastructure consists of capitalist coordinated aggregates of human instruments, undertaking what built physical environments, technical systems, and technological infrastructure cannot fully undertake book scanners, copy machine operators, content moderators, trolls, or facilitate, facilitating connections and interfaces between capitalist machines as effectively their replaceable components, couriers, runners, and cursors for machines, as transmission agents enabling capital machines to communicate with each other, or as ghosts in the machine. If global service workers, helper humans meshed with machines, are placed in the service of the reproduction and machines of reproduction of valorizable life, they comprise in aggregate form capitalist means of production of capital life, which often capital does not itself pay for. So in addition, as I said, to the global, um, its prominence in the global reproductive labor economy, the Philippines, as I mentioned, is also the second largest single source of seafarers in the global shipping industry, which transports 90% of all global trade. The Philippines has also become the world's largest destination for business process outsourcing, um, with a majority of its clients comprising US companies, and it is the leading call center country globally. It is in this capacity as a major producer and provider of deterritorialized, serviceable, ancillary humans, as disposable service labor in industries of global reproduction, and as mediatic components of productive, critical global infrastructure, that we see the importance of the Philippines' historical transformation for today's new global economy. Undoubtedly, this deployment of humans as media in these examples, racialized and genders, is a testament to how the legacies of colonialism and slavery continue to inform the dominant protocols codified in the most advanced capitalist media technologies as a means of value extraction. Indeed, we see the striking continuity between um, domestic work and nursing. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, we see the striking continuity continuity and the function of colonial slaves as the bodily instruments and tools of sovereign masters. And on the other, the contemporary function of non-subject humans as media for the servicing of the demands of full subject humans. Alden, Marte, uh, Wood, and Stephanie Santos rightly observe the continuity between domestic work and nursing and content moderation seeing the latter as re, a remediation of exported Filipino care, which, and the, the work of John Padius on um, Filipino sociality and, and re relationality also um, argues this with respect to call centers, that this care, which runs across um, these uh, technologized forms of uh, functionality, becomes encoded into the architecture and protocols of information technologies. <clears throat> However, if this view of the contemporary deployment of humans as media enables us to track these lineages to continuing pasts of slavery and colonialism, it also allows us to glimpse forms of mediatory agency that the colonized and their descendants have developed and depended upon for their survival in these systematic interfaces that um, they're compelled to inhabit. To see global servants as a means of labor, as machines, which in our humanism we don't want to see, but this is the function, rather than subjects of labor, allows us to see other possibilities in, um, in their mediatory agency. 
We see, for example, the way migrant workers, as well as the expendable populations from which they're tempor temporarily redeemed as servants, the way they view themselves as manipulators of cash, speculators, investors, and banks, um, bankers, and cash themselves, that is, forms of a soft currency that they speculate on, invest in, and gamble. Um, they see themselves as ATMs, machines of foreign exchange. Global servants and their dispersed networks deploy their own distributed selves, capacities, and channels as collective liquid assets for survival, relying on a social ca calculus that is made to converge with, but is also in excess of financial logics. As creative media, their forms of social calculus consist, for example, of div dividing and distributing, but also integrating and coordinating persons and their substances and faculties in order to ensure social as well as individual survival. It is these forms of coordinated capacities, the part of, part ability of persons, their substitutability and transmutability as auxiliary components of elastic social bodies, and by this I mean their, their networks, that enable their social kin networks to function not only as vital infrastructural support for human capital, but also as vital platforms of their own life ventures. So vital platforms, are dynamic human mediatic systems composed of kin and affiliative connections, which act as active conduits of transmission, transaction, augmentation, depletion, conversion, and redemption of values in multiple currencies. And I'm alluding to this thing called, what the, in, just as a shorthand, gift economies, of the way kin networks um, work as, uh, as platforms of social survival. Consisting of people lending, pawning themselves, their bodily capacities and faculties and their connections as creative media and objects of social making exchange. These platforms act as a collective means of life and the very life itself of shared being, whose members are components, programmers, and users. The vital platforms of Filipino kin-based social networks are not only support systems that allow them to adapt and survive in the host country, as performing kinship systems, which are pragmatic, distributional, allocational social logics, the network of Filipinos are vital platforms of social reproduction, consisting of coordinated channels of information, goods, funds, persons, and actions. They're organized recruitment systems, they are credit systems, social mediatic systems for the self-replenishing and self-renewing of their domestic communities, transnational households, and extended and stretched families. Such is their importance that employment and state agencies themselves rely on and tap them as reliable mechanisms of their capitalist industries and as systems of welfare provision, which subsidizes the cost of production of this stratum of servitude. There is a pernicious side to the cultures of survival I described, evidence in Duterte's war on drugs where extrajudicial killings have become a lucrative derivative enterprise based on bodies as absolutely expendable assets on which another higher derivative level of value realizing trading can occur. With each execution garnering financial com compensation and serving as an occasion for the proliferation of monetary and other kinds of gains. Um, this is from the, from the work of the journalist um, Sheila Coronel. Extortion of suspects before arrest, ransom of kidnapped suspects and their relatives, commissions for authorized funeral parlors, ransom of dead bodies, career promotions, etc. cetera. Um, uh, this is a situation that Sheila Coronel has described as murder as enterprise. As documented by investigative reports, the police prey on people's filiative communities, holding a member hostage in order to force their kin to generate revenue from their own connections and capacities, actual and promised, to pay for their own lives or to pay even for the release of the already dead, their dead. The families thus function for the police as a distributed mechanism for cashing in on multiple lifetimes beyond even the entireties of their own. What the police prey on there, therefore, are not people as individuals, 
but rather people as individual components of a form of social being now deemed the very, beyond the very bounds of humanity. As the Secretary of Justice countered against the accusation that the drug war constituted crimes against humanity, I already said that is not true. The criminals, drug lords, drug pushers, they are not humanity. And yet, the police are also component parts of a shared social being, of platforms of their own. As Arian, the sister of one extrajudicially murdered victim, Hart de Chavez, remarks, my sibling was sentenced immediately. She was sentenced before even appearing in court. They killed her like an animal, as if she were just a bird, that even if it weren't sick, just died like that, as if nothing. And them so pleased with themselves that they were able to get money from this. They'll go up in the ranks. They'll feed their families with what they earn from this. Heart is treated as an animal without attachments. Kinless, socially dead, coined, liquidated, to support the entwined vital platforms of kin and political power that the police are part of. The lives of the disenfranchised are merely the disposable medium of the enterprise of financial and military securitization of the Philippine state, which promises to restore the value of the serviceable lifetimes it has long offered up to capitalist platforms. Indeed, as demonstrated by the early police practice of using the murdered bodies of accused drug users as surfaces to write messages and various hashtags, uh, which prompted one journalist to describe the style of killings as murder as meme. Dead bodies are the material and media of content provision for a new urbanist political Philippine platform. They are what Lazarata calls power signs, like money acting directly to create and break alliances, connections, obligations, and indebtedness. That is, the dead bodies like money is used to make and transform relations. We can see at work in this new political platform, the scaling of family and clan political networks to the fit of a transnational nation, as suggested by references to Duterte by his supporters as puan, which means the trunk of a tree, literally, but it actually also means it's a word for leader in capital. But one that in older contexts also refers to family lineage. It's also suggested by the critical artist Magpies Press, which uh, they made a brilliant little photo album and they called um, the, uh, that, that it was a satirical rendering of Duterte as Tatay Digon, or Daddy Digon. Digong is uh, Duterte's nickname, and, and portrayed him as a family or um, clan patriarch whose provision of formidable, courageous protection and empathetic care um, in, is emblematic in his slogan, Tapang at Malasakit, which means brave and empathetic, is understood to apply to all loyal kin across diverse sex, gender, class, ethnic, regional, and regional identities. What galvanizes the diverse affective currents coursing through this platform, its pact and promise, as it were, which Duterte might be said to act as the figurative practical instrument for realizing, is precisely the redemption of that collective life of national clan belonging for which its familial members will claim the proper human name, Filipino. As suggested by the, that, um, this Miko Aguilar's collage of armed Catholic cherubim and World War II pinup poster girls, symbolically buttressing Duterte as money form in Rod We Trust is, is a reference to the money form and sovereign. A long history of violent colonial promises seeps into the imagination and realization of such redemptive power. Jason Dee's um, this the this I Am the Redeemer, Tagapagligtasako, is the title of a sculptural piece um, by Jason Dees, featuring a plaster cast figure of the baby Jesus, Santo Nino, swaddled in the same packaging tape used to wrap the heads of killed suspects in the drug war. We glimpse in this protest artist image mocking Duterte's godlike pretension 
the retributive powers invoked in the insurgent state's reconquest of the nation. As this work in Aguilar's uh, Santo Terte highlight, in Duterte lies the convergence of money, father, and God as the figurehead and legal tender of an aggressive platform of vengeful redemption. In a global context of platform totalitarianism, that bid for valued life necessarily bears colonialism's moral and economic injunction of punishment and its contemporary racial capitalist deployment as a mode of value um, extraction. So how then to defend or militate against life worth expending without redeeming it through servitude or conscription to a global capitalist life worth living, knowing you know, with all that valued life depends on. Along with money and violence, words and images are not only among the contents and actions, the currencies fueling these subaltern capitalist um, platforms, but also among the power signs as gifts, helps, tributes, making them, creating the pathways <clears throat> of these organizing systems of both life making and life taking. EJK means extrajudicial killings. <clears throat> um, so I'm just, the, the last part of my talk is going to focus on some of these artists that I've started to show. They are from this coalition of um, are called Dresbach, which is um, slang for, um, well, it's from the, the word rest back in English, but it's slang for, um, like, I got your back. So it's like your, your gang, you know, your posse get who have your back, right? Uh, it's a retaliatory, retaliatory gesture. Um, so, in this context, in which a political economy of death is upheld by a political economy of science, uh, through which the expenditure of life is made productive, many of the oppositional images and artworks created by Resbach, this coalition of artists um, that I'm going to talk about briefly, um, who are against the killings, borrow signs from the material imagery and general aesthetic order of the war on drugs repeating and reversing them or spinning them in other directions. Many of the protest works reference, for example, the, the um, cardboard sign uh, that killers used to leave either on or beside the dead bodies of victims. Um, and this says, uh, not a model, do not emulate, uh, because often the cards would say, drug addict, do not emulate. Um, a characteristic feature of the killings during the first years of the operation. The hand scrawled messages were always a variation on that theme, drug addict do not emulate. They were part of the signature style of the killers, um, which included wrapping the head of the murdered body in brown packing tape, a style that has also become the subject of numerous works of art. Jason D's sculptural piece, which I just mentioned, um, cites this signature style by wrapping, as I said, the same, the, the baby Jesus in the same uh, brown packing tape used to silence and suffocate the, and obliterate the human countenance of the kill. These switching out of the head and face of the condemned with the body of baby Christ converts the death dealing weapon into a life protective cloth. It's an unholy mixing of the message of this medium of murderous power with the message and figure of divine redemption, evoking the feeling, I think, a sacrilege and abomination among the devout. The play on the signs of the murders constitutes an aggressive retaliatory gesture, a mockery of the mock redemption promise. Like many works, um, recasting and playing on Rafi Lerma's photograph, Pieta, um, which went viral and induced Duterte and numerous supporters to denounce the photograph as melodramatic or staged and fake, etc. These work exemplifies um, attempts to re-sacralize those who precisely cannot be sacrificed. And here's another piece doing that, calling for a revaluation of the values that underwrite the war. Against the Christ-like sacrifice of ordinary Filipinos servicing the nation with their overseas labor, which had long been heroicized by the labor exporting state for its state-saving remittances, addicts came to figure a disgusting blight of useless, worthless criminal slum trash laying to waste all that had been hard-earned and well-deserved, a plague of the living dead destroying the nation with the disease 
of their own pronounced social death. That the same materials used to sign the killings, cardboard and packing tape, are materials identified with the Balikbayan boxes full of goods that overseas Filipino workers periodically send home as gestures of their love and care, like their remittances, um, proving their worth to the nation, indexes the material semiotic connection and opposition between the worthlessness of one and the serviceability of the other. The style of the killings is thus a reflection and exercise of an aesthetic judgment on salot, um, which is the way that they were called, it means rot and pestilence. Um, an object of just hatred and fear that anchors the census communis of an avenging nation. A style that is rhetorically exemplified by the widely enjoyed, vulgar, smutty, and aggressively foul character of Duterte's speech and humor, which is experienced as the inverse of the inaccessible, misleading, and hypocritical, polite speech of elite democracy identified with the oligarchic liberalism installed after the fall of Marcus. An aesthetic of graphic, vulgar speech and representation permeates the social media scape of the Duterte platform, where dead bodies and cardboard signs, things and words, are equally message and medium, vehicles of value productive circulation, where derealized lives are memes, world images, circulating affective structures, and performative gestures that drive political fascism and capitalist platforms in tandem. Um, I don't know if I included, yeah, the Duterte cyber wars that saw themselves as doing on social media the same thing that the police were doing, um, uh, killing, doing extrajudicial murders. Um, they called them cyber Tokhang. <clears throat> Tokhang was the police operation. As satirized in Mikhail Rabara's political parable, Duon Po Sa Amen, Over Where We Live, which tells the tale of a place where people do the type font comic sense uh, and are slain for this addiction to the font. The killings issue out of an aesthetic as much as out of social, political, and economic command, which stokes disgust and revulsion at the object of filth and takes pleasure in its riddance. In contrast to employment, which has come to embody sacrifice through the figuration of the heroes and martyrs of the nation working overseas, young men hanging out on streets or tambay from standby are the image of the permanently unemployed. They figured no longer as idle reserves, waiting, ready to be disposed on standby, but rather as corrupting detritus, lazy and given to wicked habits, the designation salot, the very proof of being so. Quote, they are pestilence because they look like and appear as pestilence. Shai salot dahil mukha at asta shang salot. Like the names on the watch list of drug addicts, the distinction between sign and being, act and judgment and execution has collapsed. It is this political aesthetic order that resistance art struggles with great difficulty to oppose and reverse through a recasting of signs. The artists are trading on derivative means to oppositional aims, challenging themselves to work with the materials on the very media platforms on which dominant forces were staging their retributive power. They fought back with old and new popular forms. From a <clears throat> Christmas song video, okay? a video karaoke circulated on Facebook, in which survivors in slum communities, as well as diasporic Filipinos, um, hold uh, cardboard placards written with political resistant lyrics to be collectively sung, each shot flickering with light and movement and held to the rhythm of a rewritten popular song, to a banner um, with, um, with the words, Stop the Killings. Their letters composed of 8,000 warning pins, symbolizing the number of deaths at the time of its making pass on from gathering to gathering across different parts of the world with other people enlisted to literally stand behind it in solidarity. Artists are engaging in live borrowings. While the words in the video are prompts for a collective political carol with, with these, the members of the targeted community standing, signifying the sentiments to be sung, they're living bodies, no longer dead bodies, but sitting, standing, serving as the standard bearers of another messaging, 
The words on the traveling banner <clears throat> serve not only to convey a semantic message, but also function as an imaginative physical object whose own conveyance across context through the social and political networks of Resback artists is itself the process of extending those networks of solidarity and dissent. From Manila to Bogota, Washington, D.C. to Berlin, the banner traveled with and through artists and allies, occasioning the temporary organization of audiences and strangers, physically requiring people to stand behind and support the unfurling message uh, in places and streets, plazas and streets elsewhere. With every group performance of the upheld words, photographed and shared on social media, humans offer themselves as the media of communicative acts geared towards the constitution of a different translocal and transnational political platform. If words and images are the means for making and remaking the socialities that are social networks, that is, if they are part of vital platforms, um, the political import of the configuration of words and images of signifying and performative gestures lies in great part in these kinds of social making that they are moments and means of. In this context, replete with speech acts as political claims, representational statements and expressive demands, the um, evacuation by Resbach's founding artist Kiri Delena of the placards of historical photographs of past protests and demonstrations do not only call for new words, new slogans, these photographs also show people standing with nothing but poster paper as barriers, protections, screens, as if self-guarded but defenseless against police and cameras and spectators, speechless yet demanding, wanting participatory inscription like unfinished memes. We might juxtapose them to the kerchiefs, and this is my last slide, which survivors wrapped uh, with, with which survivors wrapped their own heads, on which expressive faces were drawn to mask their own, to protect themselves and their families as they joined protests, rallies against the government. Photographed by Rafi Lerma and others, the kerchiefs at once reiterate and depart from the photographs of the wrapped heads of those killed, smiley faces drawn on them by their murderers. In striking contrast to the latter, the kerchiefs worn by survivors present sad faces and tearful eyes expressive slogans donned by live persons circulating among the crowds, marching and protesting on the streets. As in Delena's emptied photographs, the living are the bearers of signs awaiting action or response. The survivors are live media of messages of their own persistence and resistance against being the mere substrate of the state's writing, speaking their grief in minimalist strokes with their fullest expression yet to be realized. Talk of weaponizing languages, images, and performative utterances obscures how representations have also long served as things and forms of action, where signs are also gifts of live exchange, as in the case of so-called ritual speech, which serves as much to constitute social relations as to impart meaning. Artists and photographers themselves have been lending themselves as the means of such sociality, individual parts of emergent vital platforms of another kind. With the crucial cooperative help of the urban poor activist organization Kadamai, Resbeck artists have sought not simply to represent the suffering of urban poor communities, but to commune and collaborate with them in the creation and performance of expressive forms with practical aims. Um, so as one example, and there are other examples, Eya Torado, who is a dancer and her uh, a dance company, work with survivors in movement workshops um, and performances, engaging them in bodily working through their grief, in the bodily telling of their stories, which also became acts of healing. And through this shared grieving, the suturing of a community of survival. Put toward remaking social life with communities, which the nation consigns to disposability. These creative works call attention to the social milieus that art emerges out of and reproduces within the global order of capitalist production and consumption. Rather than reproducing dominant social milieus of art as a value productive industry, the activist artwork of Resbach mobilizes, extends, and recreates existing socialities of dissent and sustenance. 
Here, those words and images serve as gifts and help in the making of another social economy in which those who struggle the most to survive, quote, those hard up and without anyone to lean on, might fully belong. In this collective political project, art returns to its role as modes of expressive, expressivity for collective living, healing and sustaining and animating transpersonal spirit and feeling, affirming and building, reaching for another community and for the possibility of another global mode of life. Thank you. Time for Q and A's. I'm also speaking loudly so that the people on Zoom can hear us. If you're on Zoom, please do me a favor and go ahead and log your questions for Professor Padiar into the Q and A function. Um, but maybe we can start with a question from our physical audience first. Just raise your hand. And we'll come on. Uh, just to summarize, I mean, I in your presentation, uh, how would ethics and morality? Some moral agency for lives made disposable figure in the context, for instance, in complicity in the genocidal violence. I'm sorry, could you speak a little louder? Sorry, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So earlier on, you gave examples of, for instance, complicity in the colonial violence in Palestine. I was just wondering how and if it is possible for ethics and moral agency to figure for disposable lives or not, or how that ties into the sort of colonialism reproducing itself through the operationalization of these lives. I don't know if you have any thoughts to that. Um, you know, ethics and moral agency aren't categories I work with. Okay. <laughs> um, and partly because, um, you know, as you can see in this very broad, I'm giving you a very broad sweep of what's going on globally, that um, what I'm interested in are, uh, or something like, not even the ideologies of these, but the protocols of uh, what creates disposability or expendability. So often moral agency and ethics, right, and these ethics and moral agency can be two very different things philosophically. You know, moral agencies can be within the very, you know, ideological order, um, you know, what's right and what's wrong. You know, the drug users are wrong. They, they have, you know, they, they are purveyors of wrongs. Criminality is wrong. So, so here, morality doesn't help me because, in fact, the biggest moral injunction here is the one that's called just war, uh, which has been the injunction from, for colonialism taken from St. Augustine, passed through Spanish colonialism, and those protocols of punishment continue to inform racial capitalism today including the, you know, the system of incarceration. So punishment, I try to see actually in this book, has a long history of being a moral injunction and yet is actually a protocol for racial capitalism and today, very perniciously, is directly a mode of value extraction. You know, the punishment industry, I mean, it's not called an industry for nothing, right? Punishment that creates, produces. It doesn't simply respond. It creates. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's just that I can't really get to the question of ethics and morality from where I am, because um, unless perhaps you're coming at it from another place that I don't, I'm, I'm not getting here. Um, yeah. In the back, let's throw it. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, Ten questions, but I'll ask one. Um, I'm studying addiction in the 18th century in England, and one of the things that you see is the revenue of ta tax revenue is 25% from alcohol, but there's a distributed campaign vilifying, especially women, using particular drugs, in this case, gin. Is there a similar production and extraction of value from the production of drugs at the state level? that then is also simultaneously vilified in particular populations. Who is making the drugs and how is that money getting distributed? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you the details of the drug industry, um, but I have a re colleague, a researcher in, the, in gangs in South Africa and the Philippines, 
who who um, tells me that you know the there are obviously there are drugs and there is an economy of illegal drugs that passes through all of these illegal zones that have proliferated uh, in the wake of 30 years of neoliberalism actually violence-based illicit economies have grown not just drugs smuggling all sorts of things they're all tied together and they involved uh, they are transnational and as we know at least in contemporary times um, the drug industry is very much part of the security industry, the history of wars um, in the Cold War, right? But um, I cannot tell you the details of this, but my researcher colleague says that when he's researching in the Philippines, unlike in other places that are really saturated with drugs, there is no, there, there is no drug, there is no narco economy as we know it in the Latin America or even in South Africa. He says that, you know, when you go into these neighborhoods, you could smell the drugs where they are. But in the Philippines, he said it's not. So part of the war on drugs comes from a playbook, right? Ideologically. I'm not saying there is no drug economy. There is. But that also is on par with all of the violence-based, illicit criminal economies that are going on. So for me, it's part of a larger picture of these, um, of these illicit economies that are proliferating around the edges of, of a, a formal urbanized economy. Um, you know, so I talk about human smugglers, etc. But I cannot say to give you, I cannot, this is not my area. The, the details of the actual uh, drug economy in the Philippines. How can individuals competently network installed base methods of empowerment in the framework of the global office? How can individuals? How can, yes, how can individuals competently network the kind of installed base methods of empowerment for them to you know, get out of the use of their life as, I guess, a form of exchange or a uh, currency, in a sense, within this globopolis framework? Well, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, I think it's an ideological conceit of self as individuals and to think of that as a place for the solution, since capitalism itself does not treat you as individuals. So um, even though that's ideologically still the gold standard of uh, free citizenship and subjectivity and so forth, so um, this is my way of saying, I don't think individuals are the solution. I think socialities and the redirecting of our socialities and the, and uh, the forms of how we understand our personhood as intimately, you know, part of shared social being. And I, by that, I don't even just mean humanists. I don't mean shared social being with humans. We know that, you know, the capacity for us to think of our shared social being with the planet is absolutely vital to stop the, you know, the conversion of everything into raw material for value extraction. So there's a larger argument in this book about, you know, the situating ourselves outside of this humanist conceit of individual agency, which we have been with for the last, you know, several hundred years and is a legacy of colonialism. I have a question from uh, the, the Zoom webinar I'm from Stephanie Santos. Uh, it's a question about Kadamai's takeover of abandoned housing projects in Metro Manila. Uh, and Stephanie writes, there's a lot of state-sanctioned violence against urban poor families, despite how they seem to be perfect neoliberal subjects, e.g., let us take over these crumbling structures and we'll make them into homes. Do you think this pushback against housing justice is in part of violent state retribution to urban poor people's refusal of expendability? Um, so can you repeat the last part? Is the no, the question? Yeah. Do you think that this pushback against housing justice is in part of violent state retribution to urban poor people's refusal of expendability? Absolutely. The demolition of homes, the the homelessness, is a produced condition. You know, the fact that there are slums is not because po people are poor. It's because they have been rendered homeless by landless by um, land appropriations and dispossessions. So it continues on and on, which, by the way, connects to the demolition of Palestinian homes. There is a global, there is a global kind of homelessness that is being created that creates expendability. The, uh, the housing justice program is in keeping, you know, the housing justice movements are in keeping with the fight against the production of this expendability of people.
and, and their devaluation. And it happens everywhere. So, for example, you know, I mean, the creation of refugees is the creation of homelessness. It's the destruction of everything that supports their lives. It is an assault on the social reproduction of people. You assault the social reproduction of peoples, that's how you make them disposable, because they have nothing else to rely on. So thank you so much. I learned everything, you know, a lot. It feels like I learned of everything. Uh, but so my question is, uh, something you broadly uh, sketch out there is the global consumption of servitude. Um, so I wonder if there are any lessons you've been taking over the last two years where so much of global consumption in many parts of it in so many ways had to slow down, literally slow down. And that slow down, of consumption of servitude, or in, are there anything that anything that stands out that we might take some um, heart or lesson from? Uh, the machinery just really just broke down. That was supporting everything that you uh, uh, showed us. I mean, you might have answered your own question that you know so much slowed down, and we were able to live, and we were able to live differently, although in challenging ways. And that amount of consumption did not have to happen. And yet, I have to say, to, put a little, to pin that bubble a little bit, Amazon made more money than ever during the pandemic while people were dying. So that, that consumption also did continue. And, and um, perhaps there wasn't enough. But if there wasn't enough stoppage, there wasn't enough of a realization that everything I'm talking about is so intimately con um, connected to our lives worth living here, and the lives worth living for everybody. And that is one something that I want to make clear in the book, that we're all in this, and there, you know, there, there, is no, there is no other place out there. This is all part of the same economy between lives worth living and lives worth expending. And if people could understand that, if they, they actually understood that during the pandemic, to some degree, but now there's such a rush to normalization, that I fear that some of those insights and some of those realizations are are getting lost. So just a quick follow up. Uh, so I, I heard you just said, of course, um, what about certain sectors of the global economy, like the cruise line sector, that the cruise lines, the, 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 the ships, they had to practically come to a standstill. Was there, has there been any kind of moment of, of uh, introspection, reflection in the industry among the workers, like what, what happened to all those workers? Where, where were they? I'm sure a lot of them got stuck in certain countries for many uh, for months on end. Yeah, I don't know if it, if if they themselves had you know came to some realization, but you know the workers aren't the ones who produce the conditions uh, that they that they that they uh, have to face. And I, I don't think that the cruise lines or any of the businesses that suffered um, have totally become radically communitarian. I think they're just like looking for new ways to reinvent themselves to accommodate, you know, some of these. I mean, it's all about accommodations and creating new normals and creating new protocols so how we can live with this, right? Um, so again, maybe my, the pandemic has really like dampened my, my optimism. But I, one thing I don't talk about here in the talk, which the book is about, is the forms of living without value that we can glimpse, that we can see, that they're very, tr they're small, they're small kinds of instances, but they remind us of what it might mean to tend to just living uh, without having to be productive or produce value out of every waking moment. Thank you. There's another question from uh, the Zoom chat. I think it's about um, the kind of long, long durée sense of thinking about um, some of the things that you brought up. And the question is, um, can we really make change to dismantle systemic frameworks that took centuries to build and inevitably sustains itself in the nature of things like you know, colonial mentalities and those kinds of things? Well, I don't think we really have a choice <laughs> to, to make change or not, right? I mean, I think we have to. Um, if and uh, sure, we can let the, you know, as they say, the 
you, the human species can be wiped out, but the planet will still uh, survive. I don't think that's particularly a consoling thought, but you know, just the fact that it took centuries to happen does not mean, and this is what the work is trying to do, does not mean to say that there is not an abundance of forms of survival that people have invented all along the way that we might heed. And my, the notion of vital platforms is to say, we have made these things. We know how to live. We know how to survive. We have created forms of affiliation, forms of self-governance, collective. You know, there are many good things here that we have to parse out, remove from the ways that they're subsumed by, you know, dominant politics and dominant economies. But there are forms of survival. It is not that there is nothing, right? And that is what we have to keep our eyes on. There is never a total subsumption of the forms of survival that people invent, persist in. Those things are there, but we have to separate them out from the ways that they reproduce, not just ourselves, but capital. That they reproduce the very systems that take from, that, that use, that absorb it as either raw material or machines for capital, which is what capital is now doing. It's relying on the machines of human survival. Disposability is not what fuels the global economy. That's not the subaltern drive, driver. The subaltern driver is people's forms of survival. They're life-making. And so we have, there is an abundance that we have yet to recognize. I think on that uh, redemptive note. Um, <laughs> redemptive note. <laughs> redemptive note. Let's uh, do, do me a favor, please, and give uh, Professor Tadia a round of applause. <laughs> thank you all for attending in person. Those of you online, thank you for attending as well. Please be on the lookout for the third and final installment of the Chow Center's Transnational Asia Speaker Series. We hope to see you there as well. Have a great uh, rest of your evening and take care. Thank you. Thank you.